school year. And there are a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, so many potential new experiences, so many potential new friends. Uh, this school year is just pregnant with potential. It is, it is full of potential. Uh, there's potential for awesomeness. There's potential for disaster. There, there's potential for success. There's potential to fail at some things, which isn't as bad as we think it is. Uh, there's potential to grow. And there's even potential to miss all that potential that, that's in store for us this school year. Um, how many of you were at the Red Pride picnic on Sunday? Uh, there's a bunch, a ton of RSOs, that's uh, registered student organizations, uh, out in the courtyard uh, with tables set up, and his house had a table there too, and uh, they were all vying for your attention. And uh, a couple, in a couple weeks, uh, there's an announcement the cards party is coming up. It's kind of like a bigger version of the Red Pride picnic. It's over in the Rider Center. In addition to RSOs, there's businesses and restaurants and churches and nonprofits that will be that, that will be represented there and they'll be giving away a bunch of free stuff and, and all those tables, all that free stuff is all aimed at one one purpose. It is to get you guys to go to their thing. Go to that restaurant. Go go to this business. Go to this church. Go to this academic club, this career club, this fraternity, sorority, this campus ministry. If you zero in on the, the spiritual side of that theme, uh, the message is often, go to church. It's what, it's what we hear a lot. Uh, maybe you've gone to church your whole life. Uh, maybe tonight is your first step into the world of church. And either way, we are so glad that you're here, and I want you to know that this place is intended for people in that whole spectrum and everywhere in between. Uh, in a moment, I want to challenge us with an idea that is different from this theme of go to church. And that we may have heard all our lives, maybe we've made assumptions about it, uh, that maybe Christianity is about going to church. Uh, about a week ago, um, Heather was listening to a uh, streaming a message by Stephen Furtick. And uh, he's a well-known, very energetic pastor uh, who leads a, a multi-site megachurch. And uh, I overheard the message. We're, we're working, doing some home improvements, and I was listening in to what she was saying or what what was uh, on the message. And part of it, he said he was, he told this story. He was traveling and met this guy who recognized him and was just starstruck. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is... You're, you're Stephen Burdick. You're my pastor. And he's just so excited and just went on and on. Oh, you're, you're amazing. Your messages are so inspiring. Like, I can't believe I'm here with my pastor. And uh, Stephen Burdick's a pastor of Elevation Church, which is a multi site church. They got lots of campuses. There's just no way for him to know everybody in the church. And so uh, he tries to get to know this guy a little bit. Okay. Great, so you go to Elevation Church, what, which site do you go to? Which campus do you go to? And he's like, oh, I, I don't go to any of the places. I, I follow you online. And he's like, oh, okay, so you subscribe to our YouTube channel. No, Instagram. So there's one minute, 30, 60 seconds of Stephen Furtick's message that gets posted to Instagram. And uh, this guy's going, ah, not you're my pastor, you're my pastor. Because he hears one minute of a message once a week or less. Um, a couple days after I, I heard this message, uh, I was listening to a message by Craig Rochelle, who's also a very energetic pastor of a multi-site mega church. And uh, he told a very similar story to what Stephen Furtick told. And uh, he, he said that he was um, out with his family in this marina. And this boat comes in with a, a family, comes into the marina, and the, the family recognizes him. Oh my gosh, you're Craig Rochelle. We go to your church. We go to your church. And they're just so excited. They have this 
big energetic fun moment. They, they chatted for a bit. Uh, but after a few minutes, the husband uh, pulls Craig aside and asks, gets real honest and asks, can you pray for me? And Craig's like, sure, I'd, I'd love to pray for you. And instead of praying, asking for like one or two prayer requests, he just pulls out this laundry list, like his marriage is in shambles and his kids making choices, like really bad life choices. And uh, he's feeling financial pressure because they really should have bought that boat they pulled up on. And he hates his job, and the list just goes on and on. And Craig's like, oh man, this, this needs more than a prayer. This needs some follow-up. So he's like, okay, which, which uh, campus do you go to for Life Church? And like, it's a big place. Some, some bigger cities, they might have like several Life Churches in that area. And the guy's like, well, it's the one... I don't really know what it's called. And Christ's like, okay, uh, what's the name of your campus pastor? And the guy's like, I don't know. Okay, you, you go to Life Church. Like, when was the last time you were there? And this this happened like just a couple weeks ago. And it's like, Easter. And so, I go to your church, I go to your church. Um, at that point, Craig changed his strategy with that guy. I'm going to share some advice similar to the advice that, that he gave him. So, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you're my pastor, because I listened to one minute or less once a week. Or, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I go to your church probably twice a year, Christmas and Easter. Uh, it's a very similar story. On top of that, uh, my family and I and, and several others were at 242 this past Sunday, and they, they had this announcement, hey, next week we're starting a new series, and it's, um, where is it? Uh, who needs church anymore? So, really along the same line of thought, I don't know where they're going with it, but I'm thinking it, it's going to cover the same sort of issues. Do you ever feel like God's telling you something from all these different sources, and it keeps throwing the same message at you. So I, I felt like that when I was uh, thinking and praying about the, the message tonight. So we live in this American Christian culture where go to church, it is the message people keep receiving. Go to church is not the message of the Bible. Um, people don't become Christians for the purpose of going to church. Uh, God's calling on your life. The, potential that God has ready and waiting for you is so much more than simply going to church. Because we all know when our mindset is go to church, there's a tagline that goes along with that when I feel like it. Uh, oh, do we have to go to church? I stayed up too late last night. Oh, do we have to go to church? Feel like being social, and there's that person on the worship team that is off key, and, and there's that person that's going to corner me and talk for 20 minutes about themselves. And but Troy, you're the pastor. I have to go. So <laughs> um, I'm kidding, kind of. No, but seriously, there are times, there, there are seasons and, and weeks when I, I don't feel like it. Um, so, especially if we don't have any role within the church, I, if our mindset is go to church, we're going to go to church like it's a sporting event, like we go to a sporting event. We're going to go to church like we go to a movie. Um, when the attitudes go to church, can easily become a spectator sport. Um, I'll go to church when we're winning. I'll go when I expect to be entertained. I'll go when there's free food. I'll go when I don't have so much on my plate right now. Um, there's so much potential to be realized if we can get past that door, if we can get past that mindset. So here's my advice for you this semester, and it's going to sound kind of weird. Uh, as you soak in all the new experiences available to you on campus this school year, here's my challenge. Don't go to church. Don't go to church. 
the beginning of the school year, uh, while all these groups are, are trying to get you to go to their thing, my advice is don't go to church. Whether that's community church or campus ministry church or whatever, don't go to church. You're hoping there's some sort of contrast or continuation of this statement, and there is. This is semicolon. Um, but I'm going to make you wait a little bit for the rest of it. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I'd like you to pull that out. If you don't have either of those readily available, we have Bibles available. Um, where would those be? In trailer car. Okay. We have... <laughs> if you would really like a, a Bible <coughs> hard copy, Ben would love to grab you one. Just raise your hand. Or you could pull out your phone. All right, we got that. Um, or you can pull out your phone and download the Bible app for free. Um, either way. So, um, and, and if you don't know how to navigate uh, either the paper Bible or an app, I'm sure there's a neighbor nearby who would love to show you, give you a quick little tutorial about that. Um, and... Um, as you grab a couple of those, if anyone does not have a cop, uh, like a physical copy of the Bible, you can keep it. Like, take one home with you and, and keep it. So, I give it to you. So, um, we're going to look at Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version, and uh, the book of Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible. Um, and I'm going to read through the passage once, and then we're going to take a closer look. So, Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. So, we're going to go back through that, our first part of it anyways. And I want to look at the word flourish there. Um, flourish is not a word we use very often in our everyday life. Um, sounds like something that Alicia or Alina might do in a dance. Um, but guys, don't you don't generally use the word flourish. Like if you're, you find a workout buddy, you go to the ride or something, you're lifting, and you're like... Dude, you've got some gains, bro. You're really flourishing. <laughs> you might need to find a new workout buddy after that. <laughs> so, but this is in the context of trees, and we can we can get the idea of flourishing for plant life. It, it means it's it's growing. It means it's growing well. It's growing strong. It's growing rapidly. It's thriving. We just have to be careful um, when we bring that metaphor back over to talking about people that we don't bring the idea of a flourish. At least you probably, I don't know what the real flourish is. Okay, <coughs> so we're talking about the idea of growing, and that everyone listening has a great potential for that. Everyone here has a great potential for growth. And the two trees the psalmist specifically names are the palm tree and the cedar. And the palm tree grows very straight and tall. Um, and there are all kinds of palm trees, but one that would have been cultivated in Israel is the date palm. And uh, the date palm, you, you can eat the fruit of it, the dates, the dates cost, they're super sweet, so they could be, uh, you could make sugar or, or syrup from those to, to sweeten coffee or, or whatever. And palm branches were used as a symbol of victory and celebration. Uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the colt, um, people were yelling, Hosanna, there was a big celebration. Um, they're, they're laying palm branches down in front of his path, kind of laying out a green carpet welcome for him into Jerusalem, and or they'd be shaking the palm trees and make it sound like, like a pom-pom. And uh, 
at the end of the week, the same crowd turned into an angry mob and yelled, fierce fight, but that's a different story. Um, the cedar tree is the other tree mentioned. And we think of seed, you know, if you think of a cedar tree that you might find in Michigan, if you're somewhat familiar with the names of trees, we think of um, they're kind of small and scrubby looking, you know, the big one might be like this big around. Um, but the cedars of Lebanon, which is the, what this was specific talk, specifically talking about, was a mighty tree. Um, they, they grow to be 130 feet tall, which is about 30 feet taller than like full-grown oak. So it is a giant tree. Um, a cedar is an amazing source of lumber because um, it's very resistant, very resistant to disease, insects, and decay, and it smells nice. So people make cedar chests and cedar closets. Uh, cedar is what King Solomon used to panel the inside of the Temple of God in Jerusalem because it was a building designed to last for centuries because cedar endures. So when the psalmist said, the righteous flourish like the palm and grow like the Lebanese cedar, um, I think that was a very intentional choice of trees that he used for that illustration carried a lot of meaning. They represent the flourishing and that in a good sort of way. And it says that right, the righteous flourish like these trees. So who are the righteous? Are, are those perfect people? <coughs> no, there, there are no perfect people, despite what social media might give you the impression of. Um, Jesus was the only perfect person. Um, self-righteous people? No, that's not a good thing either. The, the next verse in our passage, Psalm 92, verse 13, actually tells us who the righteous are. They are those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Not just those who visit the house of the Lord. Not just those who walk by the house of the Lord. Not just those who go when they're winning or those who go when they're losing. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. So, don't go to church. <coughs> Be planted. Be planted in the church. Don't just go. We're here at the beginning of the school year uh, with all this potential. And the potential is a lot like a seed. Um, I've got an acorn. Um, the, the house where they build the announcements, this came from the backyard of the house. And um, the seed is loaded with potential. If I plant this in good soil, in the right environment, it will become an oak tree. But if I never plant it, it's never going to become a tree. It's never going to reach that potential. You see, a seed can only grow if it's planted. A seed can only grow if it's planted. And along with that, that, that applies to you, that, that applies to me, that applies to this acorn. <coughs> along with that idea, going to church isn't the same as being planted. Going to church isn't the same as being planted. If you're planted, uh, church isn't a question of where or if. It, it's a description. It, it's a statement of your identity. Uh, where you belong. So this this church group is called His House. And His House refers to God's household or God's family. It, it, it's about community. Um, it's not about a building, although buildings can be very useful. Um, a church is a people, not a place. Um, the followers of Jesus assembled together to celebrate them, to connect with one another, to contribute to the mission. But if I'm simply going to church, um, it's kind of like taking this acorn and, and touching it to dirt <coughs> once a week. Like it's never going to turn into a tree when, if I do that. Um, it's not the same as being planted not going to grow, it's certainly not going to flourish. But being planted, you, you might think being planted kind of sounds like commitment. I don't know if 
no, I, I can handle that. Um, you know, I, I might not have, if I'm, if I'm planted, I might have, not have the time and energy to go to a <coughs> hundred other things. Um, and if you wonder that, you, you'd be right. It, it does take some commitment to be planted somewhere. Um, to be planted in the house of the Lord, we have to trust that God's potential for us is always going to be greater than the potential of us doing a hundred other things. Trust that God's potential for us is always going to be greater than the potential of us doing a hundred other things. Because there are very easily a hundred other things that we could be doing with our time other than being planted in the church, whatever church whether it's here or another campus ministry or community church, being planted in a church. Uh, let's look at Jeremiah 17. Um, Jeremiah is a little bit past that. I actually put it up on the screen this time. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water, <coughs> its roots by the stream. Does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. It's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So trusting in the Lord goes hand in hand with being planted in a community of people trying to follow Jesus. Let me quickly point out three truths about this passage. Uh, when you're planted in good soil, when you're planted in good soil, number one, you establish roots. When you're planted in good soil, you establish roots. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. A great example of a root system is the California redwood. This is pretty amazing tree. Has anyone ever seen them? I have not. A few people, that's pretty awesome. I would love to see those someday. Uh, those trees can grow to a height of over 360 feet. So if you took a football field and started at the back of the end zone and ran through it to the back of the other end zone, that's as tall as the redwood tree can get, even a little bit taller than that. That's three times the height of one of those Lebanese cedars. So, um, but a redwood's roots only go down about 10 to 13 feet, 360 feet tall. 10 feet deep. You might wonder, how in the world can a tree that tall stay in the air? Like you'd think the slightest breeze would knock it over. Um, they only go down 10 to 13 feet, but they go out 60 to 80 feet, the roots, the root system. And so they end up intertwining with the roots of all the other redwood trees in that forest. Being planted in a church is a lot like that. It's not an individual trying to make their own way following Jesus. It's about becoming a strong community, seeking to follow God together, collaborating, discipling, serving, connecting, inviting. So the second truth about being planted, when you're planted, you can withstand heat and drought. <coughs> when you're planted, you can withstand heat and drought. God says, the one who trusts in the Lord does not fear when he comes, for his leaves remain green, is not anxious in the year of drought. Um, there are some people here tonight who are probably already having a rough time this semester. Uh, it might be a really bad roommate situation, you might be overwhelmed by classes or, or you know, the expectations ahead of you. Um, there might be stuff going on at home. Um, but you're currently feeling the heat or the dryness of life. Um, probably many of us here are <coughs> still in the I'm excited to be here stage and nothing's really gone wrong yet this semester, um, which is a great place to be, but we all know uh, something will go wrong and we're all going to experience that. Um, and when that heat or drought comes, there will be a huge difference in handling that between those of us simply going to church and those of us who become planted in a community that's living for the glory of God. 
So the third truth is this. When you're planted, you keep producing fruit. When you're planted, you keep producing fruit. The passage says this tree does not cease to bear fruit. What does that fruit look like in our lives? Um, it looks like the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23 talks about that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the qualities that manifest themselves in our lives when we're connected with God, when we're listening and obeying the Holy Spirit. Um, but fruit also looks like serving, befriending, mentoring, sharing your faith, or seeing a harvest in the people that, that we're investing in. That, that's all fruit as well. And when a person starts going to church, and let's say they recognize their spiritual need and they commit to Jesus, they commit to follow him, um, there's all, often an immediate flourish of fruit. Like a flourish. A, sun, a flash in the pan sometimes. But if that person simply continues to go to church, often it, it's short-lived. But if that person digs into the community, plants roots, gets connected, um, we have the support system to, to have people keep pointing us back to Jesus when we, when we get off track so that we'll keep producing fruit in our lives. So my challenge to you for this school year, don't go to church, be planted. Don't go to church, be planted. How long does that take? I mean, a few weeks from now, from now you might be thinking, yeah, I've come here three weeks in a row and I haven't seen anything spectacular happen yet. Well, how long kind of depends on uh, what you're trying to grow. If you want your life to resemble a radish, any old garden can pick those out in a few weeks. But if you want your life to resemble a tree, uh, a cedar, palm tree, a oak, a redwood, an apple, whatever, it takes a long time to develop it and it happens over time. When's the best time to plant a tree?